Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Today we've got Gavin Ortland with us. We're talking about naturalism and in a Christian apologetic confronting that thinking. It's going to be an exciting program. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. We have a great program for you today. Gavin is back with us. Before I introduce you to him and to Michael, I want to remind you guys that we're an entirely crowdfunded ministry. There are links in the description if you'd like to give. You can give a one-time gift there on PayPal, or you can give a reoccurring gift as low as 5 bucks a month there on Patreon, uh, and you get access to extra content. We just did a live Q&A. Uh, was it not yesterday, but the day before? Uh, it's about two hours long. That's going to be uploaded there to Patreon. Uh, so if you want to benefit from that content, all you have to do is subscribe and you get access to all of that stuff on there. Without further ado, I want to introduce you to Michael Roundtree, all the way from Oklahoma. All the way. So, uh, hey guys, uh, great to have you with us, watching the show, listening to the show. Uh, make sure you hit that subscribe button uh, to uh, to get content just like what we've seen. In fact, we've already had Gavin on the show before. Uh, he did another show called What Hills to Die On. Really fabulous show. In fact, one of my friends said they listened to it and, and that it was their favorite show that we've ever done. So uh, definitely go back and listen to that. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Help us out a little bit. Uh, but uh, definitely excited to have you back on the show, Gavin. Uh, you just have such a, a, a great mind for theology and uh, the right heart and the right spirit to go along with it. So pleasure to have you on the show. So um, so Gavin, uh, for those who, who don't know, could you tell us maybe a little bit about yourself and about your ministry? Yeah, thanks for having me back, guys. Really uh, grateful. Um, yeah, I'm a pastor in Ojai, California, which is northwest of LA, about 80 miles. And my academic interests are in historical theology. But I started a YouTube channel coming up on two years ago almost, and I've gotten involved in apologetics and then um, engagement with Catholic and Orthodox theology, engaging as a Protestant with those traditions. So that's a little bit about where my interests are. And yeah, really happy to be chatting again with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your book? You wrote a, uh, you wrote a book about naturalism. Just uh, could you hold, us up, hold it up for us? I think you have a copy of it. Yep. Yep. I got a copy right here. I do like the cover. So I'm Always happy to show off the uh, the cover here. It's called, yeah, why God makes sense in a world that doesn't. Excellent. Okay. It was a great book. Um, tons of stuff in there, and you really um, tackled a lot of the historical apologetical arguments. But you took it from an angle that appeals to beauty, that appeals to you know our our sensible nature to uh, to I, I guess you would almost call it a, an emotional appeal that we can all actually uh, uh, connect mm -hmm. with all human persons uh, seem to have this existential reality where we can acknowledge beauty, but you're saying, hey, uh, when it comes to creation, when it comes to fine tuning, when it comes to uh, music and even even math, you're like, hey, there's beauty here. Why did you choose to tackle this book on naturalism and why did you choose to do it the way that you did? Yeah, I think a couple of reasons. Uh, one was my own, in my own life, I've been through two seasons of angst in working through doubts and questions and struggles about faith. So I know what that feels like. I know how scary that can be. I have a sympathy for that. I really have a pastor's heart to help people who are struggling with doubt. Sometimes doubt is not safe to talk about in the church. I think we should be able to try to work through things and, and pastor people and help people. Um, I've also had a lot of friends who have deconstructed their faith altogether or have really come close to that and really wrestled through things. Or, you know, it depends on when I talk to them, honestly, in some cases about where they're yeah. at. And uh, stemming from both of those things, I, my overall impression, and this is my heart behind my YouTube channel and a lot of my writing, it, just, it feels like we're in a time of disintegration, a time where a lot of things are just falling apart. A lot of old alliances are fracturing. A lot of old confidences are being ruptured and undermined. And a lot of people are just asking deep questions. And one of the driving passions of my life is I want to be a voice of hope and reconstruction. Um, I want to help people start rebuilding, you know, and I think we can't assume anything in that. I want to start at the basics of here's why we can be confident that God exists. Here's why we can be confident that Jesus rose from the dead. 
I believe those are two great foundation points to build your whole life on. And then obviously we want to say about say more than just those two things, but those are great starting points for, for rebuilding and rethinking. So, oh man, I have a, a lot of passion about this book, so I can say more, but those are a couple yeah. of the factors behind my so, getting into that. So you would start with why God exists and Jesus rising from the dead, not with like, was Jonah actually swallowed by a fish? <laughs> shocking i know shocking shocking yeah, yeah i know well, that's where everybody always to wants to start conversation. yeah and it goes yeah. back to our last conversation about triage right i mean you know i think that could be a consequence of when we make every hill a hill to die on that may be one factor that causes people to struggle with questions of faith um because questions like jonah or other things like that those are important but if we put everything at the same rank that can't help those who are uh, sometimes struggling with doubts and questions about these things. Yeah. Yeah, that's so insightful because if we end up dying on the wrong hills, I think this is what you're saying, is that uh, is that people, it's like if they start to wiggle a little bit on the Jonah conversation, then the question of resurrection becomes an issue for them. It's like these aren't, mm -hmm. these aren't the same category. Now, for the record, I do believe Jonah was really swallowed by a giant sea creature of some kind. Uh, mm -hmm. But... I don't want to get too distracted here. Um, so let, let me ask you this. I, I actually want to get into the personal story before we kind of dive into the book content, because you talked about two two periods of doubt. And as many of our viewers, uh, or at least some of our viewers, are probably walking through that right now. Uh, maybe just, I, I think it might help us connect with you and your content if, uh, if you just share either one or both of those stories and just kind of what was going through your mind in this period, what, what led to it, how'd you get out of it, that kind of deal. Yeah, sure. Yeah, there were two seasons. One was in college. One was more recently. Both of them, I like to use the word angst to describe it because I don't even know if doubt, that almost uh, communicates a stronger feeling about it. It was more this, this kind of churning uh, worry, I guess, of um, seeing certain issues. So there are a couple factors. One is intellectually just seeing certain issues as more complicated than I previously had seen and just, you know, Kind of normal process of just working through that and saying how do i know for sure that that i'm right in this aspect of my faith or another kind of a normal process like that but that is incredibly um disconcerting for people who have been through that if you really love your faith and you have the courage to ask those hard questions it can be really uh uncomfortable another factor with that was just a sense of disillusionment um with some of evangelicalism and just seeing, you know, some fallen ministers that I had previously looked up to, um, and then some of the things in the church that were hurtful and, and harmful mm -hmm. to my wife and I, and one experience we had, and then others, and just boy, that disillusioning feeling is is powerful. Even if you know in your mind that sins and foibles in the church do not discredit Christ, sometimes it's still hard emotionally to disentangle those things. So all of that is just to say, I do have a sympathy for this topic. I don't take the view that all struggles and all forms of, of doubt are equally sort of from a hard heart. I don't believe that. I think there are some forms of struggle and doubt and questioning that are more sincere. And um, so that's another part of my pastoral heart for this is to try to come alongside those in that place and just be a help and a pastoral voice as much as I can. That's great. And you, you mentioned in your book, um, and I mentioned this earlier, just kind of truth and beauty and how those things are kind of inseparable. Can you maybe unpack that a little bit for us? Because again, I do think that we can get into kind of these very robotical uh, argumentations for like truth and then not have that beauty component uh, aspect to it. And I think that's really, really insightful. Can you speak into that for us? Yeah, this is the great thing behind the book that uh flavors the approach a little bit. It's my book is not absolutely different. I'm I'm trying to basically continue on in the in the way apologetics has been done, but with a slightly different flavor to it that I think is suited for the times we live in right now. So and really it's an old classical instinct. So in the at the start of the book I talk about the three transcendentals that the ancient philosophers used to talk about the good, the true, and the beautiful. 
And I draw attention to many historic Christian voices that have basically said to make the gospel uh, clear and compelling to those around us, we have to draw it into coordination with each of those three. We have to help people understand that the gospel is true, but also that it is good and beautiful. And uh, that's so important for many reasons. I, I quote Blaise Pascal as talking about this. And Pascal basically says, uh, look, we're not, this is my paraphrase a little bit. He basically says, we're not doing apologetics with robots. We're doing apologetics with real people. And there's, um, you know, he says, people don't want it to be true. Uh, they're afraid it might be true. And so if all you do is hammer away on questions of truth, it's just not a wise strategy. And what we want to do is try to touch both the heart and the mind and the imagination. And so I've just found that so captivating and enthralling to press that down and say, okay, here's naturalism on one side. Here's the possibility that Jesus rose from the, from the dead on the other side. Look down the road uh, for what difference they make in every area of your life, in the way that you feel about your kids, in the way that you listen to music, as we'll talk about, in the way that you do a math sum. And what you see is the, uh, you know, there's questions of truth that obtain there, but there's also questions of just what can you live with? You know, what can you actually respect and build a life out of? And I just believe that the beauty of the gospel is so helpful right now for various reasons because of the dynamics of our culture to draw attention to that. So that's, those are the three, the, the three sort of hallmark distinctives of my apologetics book are the focus on beauty, uh, using story and casting arguments in a narrative frame, and then using what are called abductive arguments, which simply means inferences to the best explanation. So it's a more modest form of logical inference. And I, I've, I personally have found that helpful. And I think that that style and strategy of apologetics might be helpful to others in the cultural dynamics we're facing right now. Okay, uh, I want to stay on the beauty question for a minute here. Um, how do we know, uh, what is it about beauty that points to absolute truth? Because, you know, somebody might say, well, you think this is beautiful, I think that's beautiful. So they might say there's there's not a universal standard of beauty. Or even for those who admit, you know, there is there at least are some things we can agree on uh, that are beautiful. How do, how do we know that that actually points to a divine being of some kind? What is it about beauty that so, so Michael's asking you to engage with Michael Scott's quote, this big fat pig is beautiful. I see the, the shrewd uh, bobblehead in the background, so I know you'll catch the, catch the reference. I am so glad the office has already thank, come up. Thank you for that clarification, too, You're welcome. Josh. I, You're I really welcome, don't even I think, I really kind of feel like without your addition there, that, that the question really wasn't coming across. 100% so agree, 100% agree. <laughs> I was in a fog until you referenced Michael Scott. Now I understand what you guys are doing. Thank you for that. That really helps You're me. Welcome. Um, my wife and I are big fans of The Office, so uh, yeah. But um, uh, oh, and now I completely forgot the question. I'm sorry. You <laughs> how does how does beauty uh, how does beauty point to absolute truth? Why oh, can't yeah. beauty exist in a naturalistic world? Okay. So the argument of the book is not that beauty necessarily does point to absolute truth. Um, there's a couple things that are going on. One is, and if I were to say kind of the main usage of beauty is not that it necessarily points to truth. There are some ways that that appeal can also be made. So um, what is called the argument from desire. You know, C.S. Lewis said his metaphor was uh, if you are hungry, that does not prove that you will get food but it might suggest to you that there is such a thing as food. You know, why would there be hunger if there's not food? And then he makes the mm -hmm. argument, why would we have this longing for another world if, if this world was all there is? So there could be ways where this longing for transcendent beauty in, in various respects, as we tease that out, could point to truth. But the greater interest of my book is not that beauty points to truth, but simply that beauty is useful in the context of presenting truth, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's a more modest claim. And basically the, the idea here is, you look at where our, where our culture is at right now. Number one, there's this powerful sense of distraction. Pe the, the greatest enemy for apologetics is not really, really smart counter arguments. I think the greatest enemy is apathy 
Mm -hmm. um, focusing on other things. So beauty is really helpful for that because beauty can often cut through that sense of apathy. Because if you make the, like, it's one thing if you say, look, the cosmological argument proves that God must exist. It's another thing if you say, you know, think about what makes your life worth living. Uh, think about where uh, will the life of Mother Teresa versus the life of Adolf Hitler make any difference at all if you just wait long enough. Um, the feeling that comes over you when you're watching your favorite movie and the ending comes and there's this sense of happy resolution. Um, is that an illusion that is basically tricking you because of your evolutionary history? Or is that a clue about where our world is heading someday? And I could go on and on, but these appeals to beauty, this, this way of trying to make the gospel enchanting, um, can cut through the distraction, cut through the apathy. I think it strikes a more winsome note amidst the polarization and anger that is common in our culture. Um, and I think it can uh, meet the disenchantment and disillusionment that many people feel. I just, I could go on and on, but I'll just to say the main thing, just the dynamics of our culture right now, I think are well suited for us to make this appeal to beauty in the way that our message will actually fall upon the heart. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. I mean, I think there's um, a great increase. I mean, I think it was, it was either William Lane Craig or Ravi Zacharias. I don't remember who said it, but when making argumentations, you know, cosmological argument, teleological argument, these kinds of arguments are great. But this idea of moral argument, of appealing to um, the moral constructs and saying, okay, there's a couple of options for us for morality that we evolved into having this idea that rape was wrong um, or it was a social contract that we as a group determined that it was wrong uh, or uh, it it's existential from us that we actually believe that there is this transcendent law that, that rape is always wrong that murder was always wrong and when you make that appeal the conscience of people present appeals to that to say yes i know that to be true even though I don't know why I know that to be true. And it seems like what you're saying about beauty is that when you make these appeals to beauty, it's not as if the argument itself is um, uh, it, not, not, not that it's infallible or that it's some kind of like concrete trope card that you automatically win, but that it's got this real strong explanatory power that kind of like bears witness with us. Um, is that is that kind of what I hear you saying? That it's not like, it's not the Trump argument, but it does bear witness with the average hearer. I think that's right. And, uh, you know, we could put it like this with with not just the moral argument, but with every argument. The appeal is number one, which is more plausible and number two, which is more desirable. And you can't have just the which is more desirable because then you're just arguing from wishful thinking. But I think you can have a both and I think it's. Uh, totally reasonable to say, so like with the teleological argument, the idea that the world is designed, that there's objective meaning that we discover rather than just subjective meaning that we create. And then I trace that down in various aspects of God's creation, wh whether there is meaning that's kind of pregnant in them or just something that we ascribe to them. Well, I think we can make a powerful appeal that meaning um, does uh, make theism much more plausible, but then we can just further the appeal to go from the head to the heart by saying it also makes this world so much more interesting, so much more evocative, so much more enchanting. When I did my research for the arguments from music and math, I didn't expect those to be convincing. I, I'm, I'm very much allergic to triumphalism in apologetics, so I'm deliberately seeking to be modest in the way I make the arguments. But when I got into those, I just discovered all of the top philosophers of music, all of the top philosophers of math. Yeah, that's not true. Maybe not all. Many are pointing to the fundamental mysteriousness of music and math. And there's this sense of, um, you know, it, they are sort of enchanting. And so I make the argument, if God exists, these things are so much more enriching and so much more beautiful. And so with every single argument we make, I think we can kind of stack on beauty on top of plausibility and just do a both end and say, look, um, Christianity is a more plausible story about reality, but it's also just a better story. It's a more interesting story. And I think that both end appeal is helpful for people to consider. 
Okay. So uh, talk to us about the cosmological argument. And some of our viewers will know what that means, others won't. So could you define what that is? And uh, in what ways does that oppose naturalism and, and speak into this, uh, this space? Uh, yeah, of just opposing naturalism. Okay. Speak the into space, Michael, that's what God did. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Josh, I just keep you coming know what? with a joke. I literally we we couldn't hand, we couldn't have clarity without your addition. Josh, so if you sorry. could just keep that, if you could keep that rolling. <laughs> now I'm just, racking just my brain know, with just also. know, Josh, <laughs> that that now you've started it, and yeah, if it comes back, and if you, it's going to come back sevenfold, ready. I know, I know. <laughs> so so yeah, help us understand the cosmological argument. Okay. I'll try to see if a, a quote from the office will come to me in the context of answering this. We'll see. Um, the cosmological argument is the argument for God is the first cause of the universe. So there's lots of different ways. It's kind of a, a family of, of different arguments. It's one of kind of maybe the top three or four classical proofs of God. And uh, I take the approach that all of these arguments are useful, all of these kind of classical proofs, and I use them. Again, I'm just sort of I'm drawing them out in the book, and then I'm kind of adding on the this sort of particular angle of, again, putting them in a narrative frame and then considering them in terms of beauty as well as plausibility. So um, the argument has been probably most popularized in our day by William Lane Craig, who draws it in coordination with modern science, which seems to suggest that the universe has a beginning point. And so the argument basically uh, suggests that God is a good candidate as the cause of that beginning, and that because it has a beginning, it must have some kind of cause. So uh, I, I've, I tend to find this argument, I start off the book with it, my own personal feeling about it is it's the most, one of the most intuitive and powerful arguments, but also one of the broadest. So it, it certainly, in my view, doesn't get you to the Christian God exactly. What I think it is most powerful at doing is kind of puncturing naturalism and just showing how uh, sort of difficult it is to really think that this physical universe is all that there is. And that's what naturalism is, because it doesn't seem like it explains itself. If you just take the existence of anything in our universe, the desk that I'm sitting at right here, and just think about um, where did it come from? You know, what caused it? We start to realize that all contingent things just trace back in a series of causes. This desk came from wood that came from trees. Those trees came from seeds in the ground and you just keep going back. And then the question is, where does it all come from? And the intuition here is that you need something that's necessary, that's outside of the chain of causation of contingent things which means not necessary things to start off the whole process. And I personally think that's a really powerful appeal. Yeah, there's that that classic uh, uh, philosophical argument. It's turtles all the ways down. Um, let yeah. me ask you this question, though, when it comes to this, because uh, we'll, we'll say that there is a cause. There is a there is a beginning. There is a, you know, a moment in time when there well, a moment uh, outside of time, if you will, where everything came into being time, space, matter. That's a it's a Christian worldview. But uh, are there naturalist worldviews that suggest that that this universe always has been and never came into being because it's always been that the universe itself was uncaused? And does that thinking, is there any proof or evidence for that? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, th this is where I think Christian apologists are are wise to be very, very careful. And this is why I like to frame this argument as an abductive argument. Again, just making a case for what the best explanation is, not necessarily the only possible explanation. Because when you start to get into the details here, um, it, you know, it's funny, you start off saying something you think is so basic, namely that the universe didn't just pop into being without a cause. And that seems so obvious. But when you, if you try to prove that beyond the shadow of a doubt, it's very difficult to do because there are these what are called non-standard cosmologies. So the basic history of this is throughout the 20th century, uh, early 20th century, people discovered the universe is expanding. It's not just staying in the same, you know, stars are all moving further and further outwards from each other. And uh, there's different theories for that. But eventually the, the dominant kind of standard way of understanding that is that if you go back in time, 
the universe is shrinking, getting smaller and smaller until uh, you get to a point at which basically space time breaks down and you get to this singularity. And so this is called the Big Bang and people, uh, the kind of classic way to understand that is that is when space time began. Um, but there are people like Lawrence Krauss and many others are proposing these alternative ways to understand the beginnings of the universe. And there's all kinds of theories about, you know, the universe is expanding and contracting infinitely back and forth is one option. Another option is that somehow the universe is self-caused or that causation works differently right there at the beginning. It's really hard to disprove those, but I find it makes the appeal still very powerful for most people to just say, it looks a lot like our universe doesn't explain itself. It, uh, however you, whatever particular option you take there and however you weigh the probabilities. So again, I like to make it as kind of a probabilistic argument. And I think it's good to be careful just to not overstate our case. Hmm. Now, wasn't there, I, I want to say back in like the 50s, discovery of background radi radiation, where you went from majority of scientists believing in, uh, now forgive me if my terms are wrong, but I, it's been a year since I've studied this, but um, that uh, there was a steady state universe that was basically kind of like an eternal universe. And then the Big Bang, the, the reason that whole theory came about was because background radiation was observed, which would have been the aftermath of this tremendous explosion. And then scientists were like, oh, I guess it has beginning. And then all the Christians were like, whoa, we already knew that. And uh, <laughs> so here's, I guess, where I'm going with that. First of all, are all my facts right? <laughs> and Josh, certainly, please chime in uh, and just help <laughs> just frame my question because it's, it's getting confusing, I'm sure. We need your clarifications, Josh. But uh, <laughs> But secondly, is it like a super, super minority of scientists that believe in something like an eternal? And is it even scientists? Probably more like philosophers. I mean, are we talking about like three people who live on an island who believe this craziness or, uh, about an eternal universe or something like it or a self-caused universe? Or is this like kind of common? Okay. I, th I think that narrative you presented is right. It's uh, so, um, yeah, the throughout like the mid 20th century. So it's like in the 20s, 1920s, and that kind of broad time where people are mm -hmm. discovering that the universe is expanding. So for a while, you've got the steady state idea uh, competing with what today we would understand is like the, the Big Bang. And Fred uh -huh. Hoyle is the one who's advocating for a steady state universe. This is where the universe is expanding and basically new matter is being continually created. And that's why it's expanding. So it's just always been expanding for, for forever going back. And um, he, so he was the one who actually coined the term, the big bang. And basically the, the other alternative did win out. Uh, so, um, like in the 70s, you basically have, I think, following Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose, basically that becomes the dominant paradigm, a, a kind of standard model of the Big Bang, where it does go back to a singularity. Um, today, for the question about, you know, how many people would have a non-standard cosmology, I really can't give an exact figure. And I this isn't my field totally, though I've really done my homework so that I try not to misspeak in it. But um, I, I would say that it is a sizable group that, that would have some kind of non-standard cosmology or some other way where they wouldn't see the universe as coming into being from nothing. So it is, um, I don't know, uh, you know, if that's 30% or a little more or less than that or something like that. But but there are a lot of people who so would take a different... More, more th all I was really asking is, is it more than three people on an island? And four, we're gathering the people. answer is yes. Four people. At least so, four. <laughs> yeah. jo Josh, no, no, where do you live again? Five? No, six? Okay, no. Um, <laughs> I, you heard me joke about the turtles all the way down earlier. Uh, that's like an old joke, not old joke, old, old philosophical argument of like, hey, what what holds the earth in space? And it's like, I think it's like a, a lion. And then what's on what's the lion standing on? And it's a turtle. And then what's under the turtle? And you go, I don't know, it's turtles all the way down. Like it's a, it's a joke, but it does kind of beg the question of the causal uncaused. Like it is, is God uncaused? Like who caused God? If everything is caused, if everything is brought into being, 
you know, you, you explain to your children, God made the world. The kid, the first thing they ask is, well, where'd God come from? Who made God? Yeah. Um, and that's a, it's a pretty popular atheistic question in a naturalistic worldview where they go, hey, if everything came into being, then you're just begging the question with God. Explain how Christians can kind of answer that or kind of, you know, uh, not place a turtle underneath the turtle, as it were. Right. Yeah, you're right. This is very popular. I mean, this is everywhere from Bertrand Russell, the older atheist, uh, to all the way up Lawrence Krauss, Richard Dawkins. Um, everybody has this objection. If everything needs a cause, a cause, what caused God? And people get a lot of mileage out of that. I read through Lawrence Krauss's book, A Universe from Nothing, very carefully. He just comes back to that again and again. And maybe it could be the theme of the book. It's what he kind of bases everything on in some ways. And uh, I think the problem is it, this objection misunderstands what we mean by the word God, because what we're positing is by definition, an uncaused, necessary, simple being. Um, now, so someone can say, oh, there is no such thing as God. But to ask what caused God is kind of like asking who is the bachelor's wife or something like that, or what's bigger than infinity, or what's the number that is larger than an infinite number or something like that. It just doesn't grasp the proposal on the table. And so um, the, uh, the, the so this is where it's helpful to see the cosmological argument is not claiming that everything needs a cause. It's saying every contingent thing needs a cause. Things that come into being or things that are not necessary need some kind of explanation for why they're here. But the whole idea is we need something that isn't contingent. We need something that starts the process that explains why there's anything at all. And so this is where theism is such an elegant and useful and beautiful worldview, I think. It just finds a way to explain why there is anything at all. And, and the answer is there's two different kinds of things. There's creator and creation. And the reason creation is here is because there's this infinite necessary being that has always been here. And that's just what is. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a counterintuitive in some ways to think like that. But I find that to be a pretty, uh, pretty beautiful and, and um, just really useful way for explaining why our world is here. Great. Okay. So um... I'm remembering years ago, Ben Stein came out with this documentary. It was called Expelled, and he interviewed uh, Richard Dawkins and sort of makes he makes the argument about intelligent design and kind of puts it out there in Dawkins' core. I think Dawkins got real upset about this and said he was misrepresented by it. But at the end of the day, Richard Dawkins is on camera saying, yeah, maybe aliens you know, dropped some kind of seed into the system and created us. I can't remember his exact wording, but somehow we came about because of aliens. And that was his sort of bridge to the intelligent design gap. Uh, it, it was something to that effect. But Richard Dawkins isn't the first. This is this sort of alien seeding idea, which, of course, in, in my mind, I'm thinking, who created the aliens? Well, other aliens. Well, who created those aliens? Uh, and so you have the alien seed argument. Then you also have the uh the multiverse argument and uh, and i wonder if you could uh maybe speak into both of those and why you believe uh an intelligent designer who is the creator of all that is why that's a better theory than either multiverse or alien seeding mm -hmm. yeah what i like to do when drawing in those ideas is just to point out how um, I don't want to say I don't want to say this in an insulting way to our thoughtful atheist friends who might be watching this. I don't want to say how desperate is the case on the other side, but just to show more, maybe I could put it like this: that there's no worldview on the market that is devoid of mystery, unanswered questions, um, events that are so improbable that you never could have possibly guessed them. Um, no, no worldview on the market is just the the kind of obvious rational uh explication of the data you know all of because when it comes to design arguments or teleological arguments which is what we're getting into a little bit here the idea that god is the best explanation for the design in our universe um really the only uh no not only the primary alternative 
to God as an explanation for the design of the physical constants of our universe, okay, is a multiverse, that there's lots and lots of universes, and we just happen to live in this one that is so tailor-made for life to develop. And when you think about that, it's like we don't have any proof of other universes. That's a speculative proposal. It's not just something you're getting rationally from what you can observe. It's kind of a philosophical speculation. And the alien seeding idea. Yeah, I mean, it's like, so in other words, I think it can reduce the contempt that is sometimes felt for the idea of God as an explanation for our universe when you see all the other explanations are pretty fantastic too. And uh, people do have to resort to these because there are certain things that are just so hard to explain. So uh, that's that's what I like to use these things for, so to kind of make it an even playing field in a sense and just show how we've all got to find some way to explain this incredible fact that our universe is just so improbable. Um, the fact that we're here to, to wonder about it is a miracle. And so I just find it helpful to draw attention to that. Yeah, and that's helpful because you've got the like the multiverse theory is not that there is one infinitely complex universe, but that there's an infinite number of infinitely complex universes um, and that ours just happens to be maybe one of millions, hundreds of thousands, we don't know, uh, that could possibly sustain life. So it doesn't actually make sense of our world as much as it conflates the more complicatedness of the multiverse, right? Like it, 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 to the same point that we made earlier about the causal and cause, it's, you know, it's turtles all the way down, a, it's aliens all the way down, or it's just universes all the way down. You're just, you're making more, it making it more complicated unnecessarily. Um, mm -hmm. But this is a question I had to do with the, I guess, that cos cosmological argument, the necessary cause. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't this be the foundation of what we call like presuppositional apologetics, right? And then can you explain presuppositional apologetics for people who are tuning in? Because again, I think that also has some strong explanatory power for people who are just now being introduced to these ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So there's this debate between presuppositional apologetics and evidentialist approaches or sometimes other, other strategies as well. Presuppositional apologetics, very common in reformed traditions, for example, um, tends to have a different approach. It says uh, presuppose God and show that nothing makes sense apart from that presupposition. And so the way that arguments are teased out then will be very different and there will be less of an emphasis upon kind of a neutral uh, meeting ground uh, of reason that the believer and the unbeliever can meet at and hash things out. And I I think we mentioned this before, but I, I or before we started, but I, I just strongly think that the differences between presuppositionalist approaches and evidentialist approaches aren't so absolute and that actually they have a lot of overlap with each other. And so I would say that a, a, a argument for God is the necessary cause, a, a cosmological argument, and really all of these arguments, I think can be well made by people, whichever camp they belong to. Um, I think they might, it, it will differ a little bit in how they might be presented, but I think the essential argument is big enough that it can be made from either background. That's how it seems to me. Yeah, that, that's helpful. I think that it's like when you look at things like, you know, math and you have three people and you have the same math equation in front of them and that they can all come to objective truth about that math equation. Um, it presupposes that there's uniformity in math, right? Um, and for us to have a standards of morality and to say that there's uniformity in morality, it, it suggests that there is something that transcends us, right? So it's like if you want to make sense of the universe, Appealing to something that created that universe is the only way to really make sense of it. Uh, and, and, and that's not entirely true. I, I think you can make sense of it, but it tends to be quite fatalistic. Um, would you say that not having a kind of presuppositional argument or understanding of how the universe has come into being can really cause a deterministic philosophical system for people who aren't holding to some kind of causal and cause? Um, I'm not sure. I need to think about that a little more before I can answer that. Maybe it's, I needed more references to the office to understand that question, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, like when I say cause, like, like if Josh just uses Toby, big words, I can, because I have cause it's because I hate him. 
Is that I was looking up for a way to, to sneak cause into? Does that make sense now? <laughs> uh, no, it just just made him uncomfortable. Like, nope, no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, I I didn't know if I followed the original question, but I did follow the reference to the office. So at least I'm tracking with you halfway. Excellent. Uh, maybe you can help me re if yeah. you want me to answer the original question. Help me recalibrate. It's probably yeah. My so fault. with with the with the presuppositional argument, it makes sense. Like I can make sense of morality. I can make sense of science. I can make sense like these things are objectively real. Whereas if I believe that we're just meaningless, you know, uh, specks of dust living in an infinite world with no meaning or purpose, it seems to be fatalistic. It seems to have no purpose. It seems that there's no morality that's objective. We just kind of make up whatever we think is moral. You have an idea of morality. You have an idea of morality. You have an idea of gender. You have an idea of, you know, uh, uh, pr protecting yourself and your family. Like you just, you just make up whatever you want. Your truth is just whatever you want it to be. But I think that when you pull on that string long enough, it just turns into fatalism um, because there is no meaning, there is no objectivity, there is no morality. And because of that, we just kind of, I guess, live hedonistically or fatalistically. Uh, it just it doesn't seem Eat, to drink for purpose. tomorrow we die. Yeah. Ex yeah. Well, I mean, lo lots That's of a reference. atheist philosophers are will will readily admit that there is no purpose to the universe. So uh, I'm going to chime in, Josh, and, and say I. I don't quite understand where you're going because they'll they'll readily say, well, yes, of course, there's no purpose. What is that doesn't just because there's no purpose doesn't mean that like there's a God, like we don't need to have a God and a purpose. We're just naturally here. No purpose. So so where are you trying to get at, Josh? Well, I guess, it, you know, God is dead. We have killed him. And like we don't realize the effect that it's had on morality in particular. But I think broadly speaking, it's more than morality. It's even science and mathematics and and all of those standards seem to be affected. I was just I was just asking the question because I, I can see how it affects morality very clearly in our culture. But I, I guess I, I wonder if there if it does affect objectivity in things like science and our perception and the uniformity of laws in nature. Yes. Oh, man. Yes. I mean, so in the book, I talk about consciousness, uh, human choice and, and what we might call free will, uh, rationality or use of reason. Um, uh, the, the arts, music, uh, and the other arts. Um, I talk about math. I talk about love. I basically say in every sector of human experience across the board, uh, naturalism is like a universal acid. And I, I like to use, you use the word fatalism. That's a great word. I like to use the word, uh, nihilism, which means the philosophy of that. There's no ultimate meaning and say, yes, it, reduces to nihilism and i do think i i mean i i the instincts of what you're getting at i think are really profound because no one can really live like that consistently i don't think um even the philosophers who were like of of the atheist philosophers nietzsche would be one historical representative who did push that as consistently as as you can imagine and he's sometimes summarized as someone who just thought things through from the starting point of atheism and even personally it's kind of sad to wonder in his own mental descent towards the last decade of his life, how much of that, you know, what is the cause of that? I don't know, but it's sad to wonder about that. But it's it's really hard to live with nihilism. We're wired to think there is meaning and value in various aspects of life, our thinking, our relationships, our moral achievements and so forth. Now, the only, so I think this is a powerful appeal we can make to show, to show the inconsistency of when a uh, an atheist, for example, might say there's no ultimate meaning or purpose, but then they will act in various ways that do presuppose meaning and purpose. Um, all I would say is how all of those thoughts then relate to the presuppositional evidential debate. That's a separate question for me. And there I'd say I think both the presuppositionalists and the evidentialists can really make an appeal like this so far as I can see. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh I, I love that. This this is touching for me on just a thought that I've had before that um, nihilism, like it, it doesn't work for anything. And, it, and I can think of uh, philosophers and atheists who've said, well, there is no purpose. But if you just pretend you have a purpose, it will give you a sense of purpose and life will feel better. In other words, my worldview completely destroys your life. So pretend my worldview isn't true and then your life will be better. I mean, that's basically what they're saying. 
the beauty of Christianity, and I mean, other religions aside, that's a whole different show, but I'm going to go with my religion. The beauty of Christianity is it actually works. Like I've never heard anybody say, man, I found out God didn't exist and suddenly I'm free of alcoholism. No, it goes the opposite way. They say, well, I discovered God and suddenly like I had this incredible experience and now I've been set free from my addiction to alcohol. And you, millions of people over the years have said that. Nobody finds godlessness and becomes godly. <laughs> you know, no one finds godlessness and suddenly uh, becomes unaddicted, become like experiences actually being set free from those things that uh, that bring us down. And so, is that an argument for Christianity or more broadly theism? Uh, that truth works and um or maybe put it like this if truth exists we would expect that it works it actually is a is a, a worldview that makes life all around better as it turns out christianity does do that and nihilism doesn't is it mm -hmm. yeah would you yeah. say that's a good argument well, I, I personally am very sympathetic to that argument, especially as we then kind of flesh it out further in response. So one of the objections will be, of course, okay, what about other religions where people have a positive spiritual experience and their life is transformed and so forth? And I think there's ways though we can meet that concern. But I just, I very much agree with you that that sense of when people say, oh, well, you can just pretend, you know, just um, the sense of you can manufacture your own meaning, that tends to be very flimsy in the face of deep suffering. Uh, you know, in those moments of life where you're facing deep suffering or some deep existential decision, you know, think of those times where the anxiety is so thick within you that you're, you're, you feel like you're going to throw up because you're so anxious, you know, for some people, maybe that'd be like before public speaking, or uh, maybe a time when you really don't feel where you're really, really sick, or, or something like that. In any serious moment of life, manufactured meaning, self-made meaning proves flimsy. We all long for something, a meaning that we discover, not not create. And I'd, I would agree with you when in your comments about, uh, you know, um, the way truth actually works in people's lives. I profoundly agree that that's a powerful argument. Peter Kreeft has often said, and I really agree with him, that the lives of saints are the best argument. Well, I don't know if I could say that I agree that 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 person is the best, but I think it's one of the best. I think one of the most powerful appeals is simply seeing Christ work in people's lives. Uh, there's how do you explain that? You know, how do you explain? You mentioned someone who becomes goes from an alcoholic to free. You know, I've known people in my life. I think of my grandfather. I think of other people that I am thinking of a friend right now. Um, who's gone to be with the Lord, these people who are so joyful in the midst of suffering. And you think there's got to be some kind of explanation for that. Where do they get this joy? And uh, so I, I personally think that that's a powerful argument. And I think there are various ways that can, we can make it sophisticated so as to meet the objections that might come. That's great. I mean, it, it reminds me of a quote. <laughs> <laughs> if God's not real... Then who's Jesus's dad? And what are all these churches for? <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to keep bringing it back to the office. Hold as many on. Times is as I that Michael Scott for sure? It's Michael Hold Scott. On. That's right. Did you go to Michael? Did you go to Michael Scott quotes dot com? No, I went waiting. to Michael Scott School of Ministry. Um, anyway, so uh, <laughs> let me ask this question: um, Have scientists and philosophers, like right now, do we have a consensus on? Um, uh, like a, a single uh, monistic universe, all created of material things, or is there a big debate right now on if there's like a dualistic universe? Is there anything that we can appeal to for for things that are spiritual, um, things that are non-physical? And I'm I'm, I'm determining I'm defining spiritual as things that are uh, not physical, so maybe even metaphysical uh, in that regard. Uh, how does how does science make sense of that right now? Mm hmm. One of the interesting things about modernity is that in the earlier periods of modernity, science and philosophy tended toward more of an atheistic bent, but in the later phases, so you get into the second half of the 20th century and the early 21st century, there's been a dramatic reversal of that. 
many, many philosophers are theists or deists or some other kind of view that, that isn't a naturalistic view. Deism, for people watching, is the idea that there's a God who created the universe and set it up, but doesn't interact with it at all. And uh, so you think of there's a, a philosopher named Anthony Flew, who's a, one of the world's top philosophers who became a deist uh, because of the arguments. You know, that's where I've just mm -hmm. come back and just come to see. I, I really think these arguments are powerful and it is helpful to see that it is helpful to draw attention to these profound reasons we have for belief. Um, there's many, many other examples of this. In the context of my research for the book, I was so amazed to discover how many philosophers dealing with things like math and music um, find themselves more open to or even committed to some kind of worldview that uh, goes beyond naturalism as a way to explain these phenomena because they're, they just seem so mysterious and difficult to account for within just the confines of a naturalistic worldview, which I see as a very limiting worldview. And I think if you open it up and say, maybe there's another realm, maybe it's not just physical nature, that actually just opens things up wonderfully. It makes, uh, it's again, as I say, it's more plausible and it's so much more interesting and evocative and makes so much better sense of our world. So yes, there, there's, a, there's a huge openness uh, among scientists and philosophers, more philosophers, Scientists, um, I think scientists tend to be a little bit more prone to uh, assume physical explanations of things. But even among scientists, I mean, you know, the 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 Big Bang cosmology of the late twentieth century challenges many. And you can talk, you can read a lot of. If people are interested, a book by Robert Jastro. He's a physicist, an agnostic physicist who just talks about how disturbing that was for science and how it opened things up a lot. So I would just say, yeah, there's there's a great openness um, in in those communities to maybe there is something more than nature. Hmm. Reminds me of that Michael Scott quote. Uh, <laughs> You're going to try. It won't work if you do it. I couldn't. I'm not superstitious. I'm just a little stitious. Never mind. I'm not even going to try. All right. So here we go. Um, I want to come back to the math question because it's come up uh, several times. Uh, we've mentioned that math points us to God, that math seems to uh, be opposed to naturalism. But how? How does math in any way oppose naturalism? How does it support theism? I mean, it definitely okay. doesn't prove that there's a God. It definitely proves that there's a hell, without question, that <laughs> math proves that there is a hell. Oh, gosh. I know. <laughs> Just the I sheer existence. Math growing up too. I feel your pain. I hated math growing up, too. I have to also, I'll give my favorite Michael Scott quote, which is where here's the thing with my wife and I. I will answer the question after I say this. We've gotten to the point where we've quoted The Office so many times that there's times where you quote it without realizing it. Because so, for example, when Michael says how the turntables have instead mm -hmm. of how the tables have turned, <laughs> I actually find myself saying that now. And like I can't say how the tables have turned now. I always say it the wrong way, and then I realize it. Happened too. But <laughs> love it. Anyways, um, on on math. So yeah, I did not enjoy math growing up. I. Uh, Never thought you'd be able to build an argument. I was very skeptical of this. But you get into it, the, this realm of what we call the philosophy of math. We're just wondering what's the nature of math. And it's amazing just to start to think about it. I mean, so the three things I draw attention to in the book are math's permanence, math's beauty, and math's usefulness. Or that last one, you could say it's applicability to physical reality. Okay, just to take the first one, math's permanence. If we just ask the question like this, would one plus one equal two if the physical universe vanished? Now, just that question alone makes visible the sort of intuition that's at work here of just there seems to be a permanent uh, durability to mathematical truth. And from Roger Penrose to all these other uh, great minds who are wrestling with these questions and have written about them again and again, you find them bumping into this reality and saying, trying to explain that, you know, and it's so hard to explain because um, for a naturalistic worldview, reality boils down to the physical and the physical is in constant change and constant flux, whereas math has this permanence to it. And so you just wonder, you know, 
you'd say, what else could one plus one equal? You know, it's it, surely it must. It seems like it's a necessary truth or an eternal truth that one plus one will equal two. But where does that truth come from? In naturalism, you know, what? How does the physical realm generate this permanent realm of mathematical truths? And sound may this is sounding kind of nerdy, this argument, but it really I find is kind of fascinating. And again, you read the top philosophers of math and they're all puzzling with it. And then you get to its beauty and then its applicability. And it's like amazing how consistently math works on the real world. And so what I do in the book is I say, in a naturalistic worldview, this is just very mysterious and we don't really understand why it's like this. But for a theist, there's a long tradition of thinking about math as the thoughts of God. And you've got tools by which you can make sense of that. So I basically just say, in naturalism, math is really, really mysterious. And we just don't know where that, where, did, where the heck did it come from? But for a, a theistic worldview, you have the ability to make sense of that. It's no longer surprising. It actually makes a lot of sense in that worldview. Excellent. Well, we're kind of getting to that point of our show where we need to wrap up doing some closing thoughts. So what I'll do is I'm going to toss it over to Michael for some closing thoughts, that one little thing you want people walking away with thinking about, uh, and then Gavin, same kind of thing, uh, that one thing you want people thinking about meditating on, and then just tell us the name of your book one more time and where they can pick it up uh, as we wrap up, because I want to make sure people have the opportunity to go pick up that book. I'll also link it in the show description. So, uh, Michael, start with you. You're muted, Mikey. I liked where we began the episode uh, talking about going back to just ancient times and how philosophers would look at goodness, truth, and beauty, and and talking about art and talking about math and some of the things. And we, a lot of us have heard the cosmological argument or the teleological argument, even if you don't know that that term, it means the fine tuning of the universe. Uh, we we know some of these, but to look at art and math and beauty and and some of these other things, I think there are actually a lot more arguments for God and God's existence than what we uh, tend to realize. You know, I was thinking about uh, just this as we as we talk about just the math question, the sheer fact that we have an infinite number of numbers. I remember when it boggled my mind as a little kid, like, but you, you know, you you could just keep counting on and on and on forever. I'm like, what? And then when I learned that there were infinite numbers between two finite numbers, between zero and one, there are infinite numbers between them. In fact, between zero and 0 0.1 or 0 0.1, like they're just infinite numbers. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, it's like God has written it on the number line. There is an infinite, there is an infinite being. And, uh, and it's just kind of, I, I think just hearing you talk, Gavin, it, it's kind of like, yes, we have the five basic arguments for God that philosophers give us, but you kind of look all around and God is everywhere and, uh, and the evidence for him is everywhere uh, and perhaps even especially in the lives of his people. So I think that would be my takeaway. Gavin, same question, sir. Okay, so this is just a final takeaway? Yes, sir. Like, uh, just, yeah, one thing you want people walking away thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. I'll say something that is somewhat switching gears, but maybe a good way to land the plane. For somebody out there watching this video who feels like, okay, all of that is great and all of that is interesting, but at the end of the day, I'm still sort of confused and I'm not exactly sure what to do. This is kind of how I land the book, finishing addressing that challenge. I'd simply say that I think the key uh, underneath all of this work is sincere prayer. Um, if it, it's got to, so it's, it's got to be sincere and then prayer. So the kind of prayer where you put all of your heart into the prayer. And I just believe that, um, all of these arguments are useful. They can, they're good for nourishing faith. They're good for strengthening faith. They're also good for calling us to faith. But ultimately we make that decision. We cross that threshold at this deeply interior place in our heart and soul. And at that place, if uh, I, I just believe this, that if people simply cry out to God and say, God, if you are real, show me. Um, and, and if that prayer is prayer, prayed in sincerity, I believe with all of my heart, God answers and honors that prayer. And that would be my encouragement for people watching this who may be struggling to as that will be the way forward. 
Hey, that's super helpful. Thank you so much, Gavin, for coming on the show once again. Uh, if you guys didn't know, uh, Gavin's been on the show once before. You can go check that out in the YouTube description. And I would remind everybody that we are an entirely crowdfunded ministry. So if you want to support the ministry, there are links in the description if you'd like to give. They're on PayPal or on Patreon. Uh, but I really encourage you guys to pick up Gavin's book. Uh, we did uh, the one on the right hills to die on, but we've just been talking about his book, Why uh, God Makes Sense in a World That Doesn't. I encourage you to pick up that book, uh, whether you're a Christian, maybe you're a skeptic watching. Uh, it would be helpful to read through it uh, just so to expose you to these kinds of thinking. It's probably more probable, and I agree with Gavin, uh, that with his book and, and the points that he makes, it's more probable that, that God is the answer that makes sense of these things than naturalism. Uh, and I think right now we have a world that's... Uh, uh, asserting that naturalism is true uh, confidently and loudly and regularly. And I think that we can begin to believe that just by the frequency in which it's said. So I'd really encourage you to pick up Gavin's book, uh, maybe expand some of your thinking a little bit, think uh, deeply, uh, read broadly, uh, and hopefully, uh, as always, you will be led by the Spirit. As Gavin was saying, hey, pray about these things. I think as we honestly try to expose ourselves to truth uh, and we pray, uh, God tells us that his spirit will lead us and guide us into truth. Uh, but I think having that humble heart is the first step in walking with God uh, into that revelation. So guys, I hope that you have been blessed by this episode and other episodes we've done. Go ahead and hit subscribe. If you haven't already, like this video and uh, maybe consider sharing it around to some of your friends and family as we're trying to get the word out. Gavin, thanks again for coming on the show. Michael, thank you as always. You're, you're looking wonderful there in Oklahoma. I like that smile. So, so uncomfortable. He's muted. He doesn't know. It's okay. I'll just pick on him. I'll just giggle silently. <laughs>